All right, hey y'all, how's it going? This is for Contemporary Issues class. Let me make sure the phone's lined up good. It looks a little crooked. Ah, it looks great, perfect. Okay, anyway, so like I was saying, this is for Contemporary Issues class. Uh, we're on standard number nine. Um, we actually are skipping standards seven and eight because they fit right in with this theme of terrorism. And I wanted to just go ahead and get into the specifics and teach you some, some stuff that's a little more interesting. Um, so we're gonna talk about today these different terrorist groups that the state of Tennessee says you need to know about. Um, and here they are. The first one is the PLO, which stands for Palestine Liberation Organization. You may not know anything about that, but that's okay, because I'm gonna teach you today. Second one is IRA, which is Irish Republican Army. The third is Al Qaeda. You've probably heard of that one before if you've ever watched the news. Uh, the, the next one is the Taliban. You also have probably heard of that one. The next one is ISIS, which really hope you've heard of because it was important just a few years ago. The next one is the Black Hand, which you may have learned about in US history class. And the last one is the KKK, which is one that's actually here in the United States, okay? Um, remember to email me if you have any questions and uh, visit my website where you can download this PowerPoint. Um, excuse me, just a moment. <coughs> I promise I'm not sick. I just happen to talk a lot, so it makes, my, makes me get a little hoarse. Um, my goal today is to teach you historical facts and to teach you why these groups exist, what they want, and the actions they've taken to get what they want. And unfortunately, the actions that they, that they take are usually very violent and really not great to talk about. So we're going to talk about some heavy stuff. Um, my goal is to teach you the truth and not teach you anything that might seem offensive or anything like that. Um, that's not my intention here. My intention is not to offend anybody or say anything uh, that's out of hand or whatever. I just want to teach you what's happened in history, why these groups exist, what their methods are, and what their goals are, okay? Please email me if you have any questions. Please do further research on these because it's very interesting topics to know. Um, you know, terrorism is something that's really extreme, uh, you know, to be so... Uh, to believe something so strongly, to be so in-depth with your belief that you're willing to go to violence to take to carry that out, that's a pretty big deal, okay? So let's jump right in, um, and the first one we got to learn about is the PLO, the Palestine Liberation Organization. Um, I'm going to get off the PowerPoint just for a second to show you the region of the world that I'm talking about. So let me pull up something really quick here. Let's see, internet, here we go. All right. So the area of the world that we're talking about uh, specific with this group is right here. Let's see, will it zoom? Aha, it will zoom. Oh no. So it will, we are talking about the Middle East, okay? Specifically this area of the world right here. There's a city that's listed here that is Jerusalem, okay? Jerusalem is a very important city in the history of the world. It's where three of the world's major religions uh, claim is a very holy site, okay? that is uh, Christianity, Judaism, which is the one we're gonna be talking about, and Islam, okay? So let's get back to our PowerPoint, and let's see if I can do it from here. Ooh, this is so fancy. Da -da, right here, perfect, we can get right back to it. All right, so that's the area of the world that we're talking about, Jerusalem is the city, okay? That's the main area, so think about this. So we're going back to World War II, okay? And if you recall, during World War II, there was also something going on called the Holocaust. All right, and in the Holocaust, uh, that remember that was where Nazi Germany tried to eliminate all of the world's Jews. Okay, now think about the end of World War II, the end of the Holocaust. Uh, America and Great Britain are the big victorious winners of World War II, so they want to do something nice for the world's Jews. Okay, so they say, hey. Jewish people, we know you may not feel at home in Europe anymore because of all the bad things that have happened. So we want to create a place for y'all can go that is holy to you all, that is a sacred site where y'all can go live and be and exist exactly how you want to, okay? So they decide, hey, Jerusalem is the most holy city for, like I said, three different religions. And we're going to say that y'all can sell there. Here's the problem though. When this happened, there was already a group of people living there called Palestinians. Palestine is the era where they called this, okay? And these big world governments, Great Britain and the United States, say, hey, Palestinians, you have to let 
the world's Jews in. And there's actually several thousand Jews that moved there and decided to set up a settlement there and they were protected by the British and the Americans, okay? And so the Palestinians, they basically have no choice. The Jews move in and slowly over time, these Jewish settlements grow and grow and grow and the Palestinians get pushed back. And you can see from 1947 before it started, then when uh, the partition was made where the Jews were allowed to move into Jerusalem and then it got bigger and bigger and bigger and eventually notice this present day, there's hardly any Palestinian territory left, okay? Because uh, the Jewish influence grew and they spread out and they took over Palestinian areas. So the people that lived there who called themselves Palestinians, they were not happy about this. And some people took it really, really offensively and they called themselves the PLO, the Palestine Liberation Organization. And liberation means to free, okay, to free. So they want to free Palestine from Israeli control, okay? So they called the, the Jewish nation is called Israel, okay? And the Palestinians want it back. So how is this gonna go down? Well, first the Palestinians try to fight a war and they lose the war. Uh-oh, well, why do you think they lost the war? Well. Israel had money coming from coming in from Great Britain and coming in from America, okay? So the Palestinians immediately lose a war. So they're automatically pushed under and now they're the underdog. So now they have to engage in terrorism and they do some really, really bad things over time, okay? So the most famous example of what the Palestinians did to get back at the Israelis over time, so from 1948 all the way up really into the 1990s, they did all these terrorist acts. And the worst one is in 1972 at the Munich Olympic Games. Uh, these Palestinian terrorists, they took hostage 11 Israeli athletes and they murdered them, okay? So this is really, really, really bad, all right? Um, they've also blown up some buses. There's just been a lot of things that happened over the years that the PLO did to target Israeli Jews in order to try and get back some of their territory. They say, hey, we need our territory back, and until you give it back to us, uh, we're gonna keep doing these terrorist attacks. So if you want to, you can pause and read it. I don't like to go over too much gruesome stuff. I just like to tell you why these organizations exist. Um, so you can read it if you'd like, but do know that one of the things they did is murdered 11 Israeli uh, athletes at the Olympic Games in 1972. Yikes, okay. So read it if you'd like. I don't like to focus too much on hardcore violence. I just want you to know why these groups exist. Okay, now, in the 1990s, uh, the Israeli government and the Palestinian, the PLO, uh, they decided, hey, you know what, this stuff's getting out of hand, too many people are dying, let's see if we can come to some sort of peace agreement. They didn't actually settle on any land agreements, so the Israeli government is like, hey, we're still taking over your land, sorry, okay, not really sorry, sorry, not sorry, right? And so the PLO is like, look, we're going to stop with this terrorist stuff. But then a group offshooting uh, from the PLO, an offshoot group means like you've got the original group and then they fall apart and then you get a new group. So an offshoot group of them is called Hamas, which is this word right here, Hamas. Uh, it still exists today and they still do carry out terrorist attacks in the, uh, in the, in the region of Israel, okay? All right. So why was Israel formed as a nation? Number one, why was Israel formed as a nation? Uh, it was a reparation. Reparation means like to say sorry. Reparation to the Jews after the Holocaust. Let me check my video and make sure you can see that okay. It's a little small, but I think you'll be all right, okay? Number two, what is the characteristic of the history of the region of Israel slash Palestine? Okay, so I'm talking about, and I saw this in the beginning in the first slide, I showed it to you, um, warfare. People have fought over the city of Jerusalem for a long, long time, so that's gonna be a characteristic in this region. Uh, warfare over the city of Jerusalem. There you go. What is the PLO's main desire? What is this whole thing all about? It's all about Israel taking over lands in the Palestinian region, so they want land back. They want 
want their land back. Okay. What are three examples of PLO attacks? I'm just going to list one uh, because I feel like it's the most important and it was the most famous, the most infamous, I should say rather, um, the 1972 Munich Olympics hostage murders. So they took these Israeli athletes hostage and they murdered them. Yikes. All right, number five, after the 1990s, which group replaced the PLO as a main terrorist organization in the region? It's called Hamas. Hamas, okay. Um, I went over that one really, really fast. If you are interested in the PLO, I would tell you to do um, some research on, like, on your own. Um, the reason why we went fast through this one is because I wanna spend more time focusing on uh, ISIS, Al-Qaeda, and the Taliban, because those are the ones who have historically been a bigger threat to the United States. The PLO really is a bigger threat just to the nation of Israel, um, but as far as, an, as a threat to America, and something that's a little more relevant, I want to spend more time going over Al-Qaeda. However, if you are interested in this, I would suggest uh, doing some research on your own, or you can email me and uh, I can help you out. I can, get, I can answer some questions if you got any. But um, so that covers the PLO. Remember their main goal, they want to get land back from the nation of Israel. Um, they feel like they've been cheated out of this land and the way that they go after it is doing all these terrorist attacks. Now, the PLO doesn't actually officially exist anymore. Remember, they've been replaced by a group called Hamas, okay? And that crisis is ongoing in Israel. It's still going on, okay? They still fight all the time. It's not good. All right, so let's keep moving on. All right, the next one. Now this is a little more interesting because it's actually, uh, it was in Europe, and most of this stuff that we learned about is kind of more Middle East or further away, okay? Uh, but this one is the Irish Republican Army, the IRA. Okay, so let me tell you the history of it, how it got started. And if you want to, you can pause and read it, um, but I'll just tell you too. So the IRA, so remember England, Britain controlled uh, the country of Ireland for a long, long time. And then starting in 1919, Ireland decided, hey, we want our independence. So they fought for independence and they actually won this fight. Now, as part of the peace treaty, Ireland was divided in two, Northern Ireland and Southern Ireland. They don't call themselves Southern Ireland. Ireland. They just call themselves Ireland. Okay, but Northern Ireland is a separate country. And uh, they want independence as well, but they weren't granted independence. So. The whole country doesn't actually win independence. Southern Ireland is independent and Northern Ireland stays kind of under British control under the watchful eye of the British. Still British soldiers there. So the IRA, which was the Irish army that fought for independence, stays on in Northern Ireland and kind of keeps fighting kind of a guerrilla war against uh, British soldiers here. So you can see this is the original IRA who fought the legit war, and then this was the IRA. This is an IRA fighter. Notice she's a woman uh, fighting, which is just unusual. There's, it's just kind of, you don't really see that often. Um, they fought more of a guerrilla style, kind of a terrorist type war against British occupation, okay? So they are still around today. Uh, however, they're not as violent as they used to be. Nowadays, they're more of a peaceful kind of, um, I'll just tell you more about them later because it's, uh, it's actually a little more interesting. I want to get through more of this history first. Um, so why does this IRA group get big? Why does it happen? What is the big thing here? Okay, so in 1972, remember this is post-war. There's still British soldiers there. Okay, they're keeping an eye on things. In 1972, the citizens of Northern Ireland were protesting British occupation. They say, look, we can govern ourselves. Y'all go home, but the British soldiers are there. The protest gets a little weird. The protesters are unarmed, but notice what it says. British soldiers killed 15 unarmed protesters. So the IRA grows as a group, as a terrorist group. They begin fighting all these guerrilla style fights where they're planting bombs in cars um, and they're blowing up pubs where police officers hang out. And basically they're just doing a lot of bad stuff to go after the British. They want the British out, okay? The British still don't leave, um, yeah, but over 500 people were killed in 1972. So set, 1972 was a really bad year uh, for this, these relations between the IRA and the British soldiers, okay? 
All right, so throughout the 80s and 90s, still kept going on, a lot of terrorism going on in Ireland by the IRA, still attacking British soldiers, still attacking British police officers, that sort of thing, okay? Uh, but then in 1998 and late two, or early 2000s, they decided, hey, you know what? We gotta stop all this violence. Because a lot of, the problem was a lot of citizens were getting killed because um, they were doing things like planting car bombs. And when a car bomb goes off, it often is in a public area and it kills a lot of uh, bystanders. So finally, they're, they're getting unpopular because of all the violence. And people are like, look, this conflict has gone on too long. And so the IRA in 2005 said, hey, you know what, we're done with this violence. Okay. And now what they are, they call themselves the Real Irish Republican Army, the R-I-R-A. And really what they've kind of become is a little bit like a mafia. Uh, they just make a lot of money now. Um, they deal with illegal oil, like smuggling. They also still deal in illegal weapons. They trade weapons globally. And they deal in illegal cigarettes. So they'll like rob a cigarette truck and sell them to citizens illegally. Um, so now they've become more of a money-making type thing. Uh, they say that what they're doing is keeping Ireland pure. They fight, um, like they go after drug dealers and things like that, but the thing is they're actually still doing illegal stuff themselves. So they went from kind of like a politically active terrorist group where they're trying to get the British out, um, and they've kind of just turned into like a gang of thugs a little bit. And you can even see the big difference from these guys and these guys who are like actively, you know, out fighting something and then you got these guys who get all dressed up with their sunglasses and their uniforms and they walk around. It's like, what are y'all doing? But the real thing that they're doing is just making a lot of money, okay? So yeah, um, they still do, you know, uh, it seems like they wanna carry out attacks and stuff because there's all these raids and arrests on these people, um, but really they're just making a lot of money instead of actually fighting for anything, okay? So that's the IRA. So let's answer these. What was the main motivation for the IRA? to end British occupation of Northern Ireland. To end British occupation for Northern Ireland. Of Northern Ireland. Um, if you're interested in this group, I highly suggest doing more research. They have a very long history. I mean, they started in 1919, so they have a long history. Um, I highly suggest doing a lot more research on them because they are very interesting. Uh, I feel like I'm kind of touching just the tip of the iceberg on a lot of these, uh, but if you're interested, this is one I would check out because it is very interesting. Uh, describe the time period known as the Troubles. It was from the 1960s to 1990s. And what it is, it's a lot of fighting. Why was 1972 a significant year for the IRA? It was the most violent year in their history. Over 500 people were killed. It's crazy. In their history. The 90s got bad for them too. Um, they were doing things like planting bombs at grocery stores and things like that. So it's got a little out of hand. Uh, number nine, what did the IRA promise in 2005? to end violence, to end violent activities, I should say. So now what they say is they're gonna participate in the political process to get what they want. But really, remember what I told you, they just kind of turned into like a money-making thing. It's almost, it's a little bit like the mob or like the mafia, I guess now, where they say, you know, oh, we're here for a political purpose, you know, we still want our freedom, blah, blah, blah. But really they're making lots and lots of money in a lot of illegal ways. Uh, how much money does the IRA make annually? If you caught it, it was $50 million a year. So $50 million annually. That is crazy, crazy. Let me check make sure you can see these answers. It's looking pretty good. We're 20 minutes in. Let's rock and roll. Remember, if you need to pause, uh, pause and get the answers down. And if you're interested, do more research on the IRA or email me and I can answer some questions if you got any. Um, so yeah, so there we go. And again, I apologize that we're just kind of going over and touching the tip of the iceberg on these. But like I told you before, I want to get to the main groups of Al Qaeda, ISIS, and Taliban because I feel like they're slightly more relevant to American history, okay? And living here in America, that's what I wanted to focus on a little bit more.
Okay, speaking of which, we're here at Al-Qaeda. Okay, Al-Qaeda has a long and complicated history, just like everything else in history that becomes a big deal. It's a long story and it's complicated. So I'm gonna to try to give you the quick version, but here we go. So we have to think back to the Cold War, okay? So 1979, right in the middle of the Cold War, right? So 1979. And in 1979, the Soviet Union invaded a country called Afghanistan. Ooh, you've heard of that one before, I'm sure. And what the Soviet Union's goal was, was to expand communism. Remember, it was the Soviet Union versus the USA. Communism versus democracy and capitalism, right? So when this happens, the Soviet Union invades Afghanistan to expand communism, the United States gets pretty freaked out. And also a group of people in the Arabic world freaked out too, because what they saw was that the country of Afghanistan, which was Islamic, they wanted to keep it pure from the Soviets. So these group of people, where is it at here? They are called the Mujahideen, Mujahideen right here. And who they are? They are traditional Islamic fundamentalists. So they are old school, kind of like Old Testament law type people who want to keep a very pure Islamic type religion and they want to keep out any type of outside influences, okay? Also, let me just say this. Um, when I talk about Islam and Islamic fundamentalism and all this, I'm not saying anything bad about the, re the religion of Islam. However, these terrorists, they get extreme ideas and they engage in extreme behavior. So if I criticize their behavior, I'm criticizing the terrorists, not the religion. I'm going to say that again. I am not criticizing a religion here, okay? And I say that seriously because we live in a time where people do get offended and I understand I am not criticizing a religion. I will be, I hope, I, I'm trying to try not to criticize anybody. I'm just going to give you facts. But if it does sound critical, I'm criticizing terrorists, not a religion. All right, moving on. So anyway, this group of people, these soldiers called the Mujahideen, they want to fight against the Soviet Union. They want to keep a pure Islamic influence in Afghanistan and keep out communism. They don't want the Soviets there, okay? Now, there's another group, a very large, important group of people called the United States who want to help these guys fight against the Soviet Union. Remember, this is the Cold War, which was USA versus Soviet Union, okay? USA versus Soviet Union. So that's what we're talking about. So here's the deal. These guys, the Mujahideen, who want to keep the Soviet Union out of Afghanistan, they get a bunch of money from the United States because the United States says, hey, we don't want the Soviet Union getting any bigger. We don't want the communists to expand, okay? We want to make sure communism is contained, and it works out well for these guys because they get all the weapons and money they need to fight this war to make sure it stays a pure Islamic nation in Afghanistan, okay? So, they fight this 10-year-long war against the Soviet Union, these guys beat the Soviet Union, which was like the world's second biggest military at the time. They beat the Soviet Union. It's a 10 year long war. And out of this war comes a war hero. This guy, his name is Osama bin Laden. You've probably heard of him before. Here he is right here as a young man in uh, Afghanistan, okay? So these guys, they fight this war. They defeat the Soviet Union. They get a bunch of money from the United States. So it's, it's just so interesting to me that this guy, he got money from us a long time ago and then he attacked us. Um, so he get a bunch of money from the United States, they defeat the Soviet Union, but then the war's over. So what do they do next? Because you've got, you got a group of guys who've been fighting a war for 10 long years and they're like, hey, what are we gonna do now? So Bin Laden has a great idea. He says, hey, you know what? Let's go to all these Arabic countries such as Saudi Arabia. Let's go to Yemen, where they're having problems with the government. Uh, they're, and they say, hey, we've been fighting for 10 years. We want to keep fighting this, this kind of like holy war that they believe that they were fighting. Remember, they were trying to keep a pure Islamic state in Afghanistan. So they want to take this holy war and go fight it somewhere else. And they've got a group of veterans who are willing to fight 
And they've got a good leader here, and I say good leader in that he was a war hero, not a good guy at all, okay? Um, and so they're like, Osama bin Laden, he goes back to Yemen, and he's friends with Saudi Arabia. He's actually a very rich guy, Osama bin Laden. Do some research on him, he's very interesting. Um, he knows the Saudi Arabian government, and he says, hey, uh, if you guys need us to fight, we'll fight. So here's the deal. In 1990, the country of Iraq, which we'll talk about here in just a minute, the country of Iraq invaded Kuwait, who is friends with Saudi Arabia. And this guy bin Laden says, hey, Saudi Arabia, would you like an army? I've got an army who's ready to go, and they've got a lot of practice. And Saudi Arabia is like, eh, you know what? We've got friends with the United States. The United States is interested because of oil. Hmm. And so Saudi Arabia says, you know what, Bin Laden, don't worry about it. We'll handle it. We'll get the United States to come in and help us out. This was a major mistake because now Bin Laden doesn't get mad at Saudi Arabia. He gets mad at the United States. Uh-oh. So now Bin Laden realizes, hey, I've got a lot of anger. I've got a lot of aggression. I've got a lot of experience. Why don't I use it against the United States since they were chosen over me? Hmm. He's not going to use it against Saudi Arabia because they were, that's where his original homeland was. That's where his family is from, okay? Now, let's go to 1993. So, in 1993, the United States was operating out of Yemen to fight this Gulf War in Iraq and Kuwait, which is up here, okay? So the United States has a lot of troops stationed here in Yemen, okay? They're also uh, helping out people in Somalia. Uh, they were fighting there. They were helping out with the Civil War there. The United States was, and so they're helping out. So the United States has had a long presence in this area because of oil and because of keeping an eye on different conflicts, okay? So in 1993, Osama bin Laden does something. He gets some of his Al-Qaeda fighters to blow up a hotel where U.S. Marines were staying. They didn't actually kill any Marines there because the Marines had actually left before the bomb went off. Um, but when this happened, the United States said, yo, we're going to get out of Yemen. We're, this is not worth us staying here. Uh, they're targeting us now. This is not working. So Bin Laden realizes something. He says, hey, you know what? I don't actually have to fight a ground war against the United States anymore. I hate the United States. They got tons of money and they got tons of weapons. But if I can keep them constantly worried about me and keep them constantly keeping an eye on me and not focusing on other things, I can be a pretty effective force, okay? And so what he did is on September 11, 2001, he planned the World Trade Center attacks and Al-Qaeda carried it out for him. So he was the leader of Al-Qaeda for a long, long time. Um, and their goal is basically just to wreak havoc their main goal is to end impurity from outside the Islamic world from coming in, um, but they do that through terror acts, okay? Now, in 2011, Osama bin Laden was killed, okay? Now, Al-Qaeda is actually a lot bigger than it was when he was alive, and I'll tell you why I'm here in just a little bit, but notice, Al-Qaeda still has members from approximately 55,000 people. Now, here's the basic gist of why. When the United States invaded Iraq and Afghanistan, unfortunately, the United States used a lot of force, a lot of military force. And even more unfortunately, a lot of innocent people were killed. When that happens, when innocent people are killed, that kind of makes the local population pretty angry and they say, how can I get revenge? So think about this. Think about, you got a 17, 18 year old kid and he's off at work one day. And that day there is a US military airstrike, a drone strike, something like that. And uh, innocent civilians are accidentally killed, okay? And those innocent civilians that are killed are that guy's family. Maybe his parents, maybe his little brother, little sister, whatever. Immediately he says, how can I get revenge about from this, for this country? How can I avenge my family? How can I avenge their deaths? And guess who steps up and offers an opportunity for him to get revenge? This group right here, Al-Qaeda. So unfortunately, that's why the group keeps growing. You would think, you know, why would you even be drawn to this? Why would this even be a thing? 
but it's a lot of people who've experienced a lot of hardship, a lot of poverty, they've grown up in a war zone, they've seen a lot of bad things happen, and unfortunately, it kind of turns them into bad people, okay? So, Al-Qaeda is still big and it's still growing, and it's because of the collapse of ISIS. So let's talk about that here in just a second, okay? But let's uh, answer these questions real quick. Again, we have to go over a lot of these groups, and we could spend probably a whole year talking about any single one of these groups, but I just want to uh, give you basic information that lets you go on it yourself. So, number 11, why did the Mujahideen fight the Soviets in Afghanistan? They wanted to keep out the communist influence and maintain what they call a pure Islamic state. Again, please remember, I'm not criticizing any religion at all. I think all religions are great. I just think some people get extreme and they just happen to belong to that religion. There are examples of extreme Christians. There are examples of extreme Buddhists. There's extremism in everything, okay? So I'm not criticizing any religion at all. Please remember that. And maintain a pure Islamic state. Okay? Where did the original Al-Qaeda members fight? So they started uh, in Afghanistan, and from there, they went to a country called Yemen. That country today, you should look it up, it's very interesting, it's really sad actually. It's one of the worst countries in the world because they've been in civil war for a really long time. Um, the country is also in a famine, the crops aren't growing there because of drought. Um, so it is a very, very sad situation that's growing there. And unfortunately, that terrible, the terrible conditions there are leading to the growth of Al-Qaeda because they're the, the members in Al-Qaeda, the top leadership there, they recruit the local populace uh, for their cause. And they say, hey, we can take care of you, but you gotta fight for us. This is really bad, okay? All right, 13. How did Saudi Arabia anger Osama bin Laden? Remember, Saudi Arabia chose the United States as allies over him. So Saudi Arabia chose the U.S. over Al-Qaeda to fight in the Gulf War. That was the Gulf War that I was talking about. That. I don't know if I ever actually explained that that was the Gulf War when Iraq invaded Kuwait in 1990, okay? 1989, 1990. Again, going over a whole lot of facts. Uh, remember, please do your own research if you would like to know more. I just have to give you the basics because otherwise we'd be, talking to, we'd be talking about this for like five hours. All right, number 14. How many terrorist attacks did Al-Qaeda carry out from the 1990s onward? I believe it was more than 60. I believe is what the slide said. More than 60. So many, so many. And then number 15, approximately how many members of Al-Qaeda are there in the world today? There are 55,000. Okay, all right, let me check and make sure and see how we're looking. It's looking great. We've got a few more groups to go. I believe ISIS is up next. Remember to pause if you need to, take a break if you need to, and let's rock and roll, here we go. All right, now we are ready for ISIS, which stands for the Islamic State in Iraq and, and Syria. And remember, again, I'm not saying anything bad about Islam. Um, I, I'm just talking about the extremists within that religion. I'm not saying anything bad about the religion itself, okay? All right, so um, Al-Qaeda members existed all over the place in the Middle East, okay? Before, um, you know, after the Soviet War, they went home. They had come from all over the Middle East and they went home. So there, some of them were at home in Iraq. And one of the most famous Al-Qaeda members was this guy. His name is Abu Musab al-Zarqawi, okay? Um, if you've seen the movie American Sniper, uh, there, I think most of the movie is actually a lot about this guy, okay? So he was the leader of Al-Qaeda in Iraq uh, up until 2006, um, and he led a lot of action against the U.S. military. And for that, the U.S. military targeted him and killed him in 2006. So he was a really, really bad guy, okay? Now... After that, after 2006, Al-Qaeda was really pretty quiet in Iraq, okay? 
Um, but then in 2011, the United States ends the Iraq war. They say, hey, we're done fighting this war. We've done about as much good as we can. We're leaving. And at the same time, a country next door, and I think I have a map here, yes, a country next door to Iraq called Syria, right here, let me go back, uh, start, they have a civil war there. The people there want to overthrow the government because this guy, Bashar al-Assad, he is a Syrian dictator. He's a bad guy, okay? And so Bashar, or so they have, a, they have a civil war in Syria, okay? And so this guy, Bashar al-Assad, he wants to put down the rebellion and he doesn't want anybody coming from the outside to help. And so what he says is, he says, hey, you know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna release a bunch of bad guys from prison who used to fight for this guy. Uh-oh. So what he does is he releases a bunch of terrorists and they go fight for the rebel army that's trying to overthrow him. The reason why he does this is he doesn't want the United States or other countries to give any help to the rebels that are trying to overthrow him. He's worried that the United States will give them weapons and things like that. So he says, hey, if there's a bunch of criminals and terrorists in that group that's fighting me, the United States is not gonna help them out. He's actually right about that. It's a pretty smart move on his part. It's a bad move, but it's a smart move. So what we've got is a power vacuum who takes advantage of a really bad situation. You get this guy. His name is Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi. And what he did is he said, hey, all these bad guys just got released from jail. Come play for my team. And what we're gonna do is we're going to try to take over the whole world. What they really wanted to do was take over the Middle East first, and then they were gonna go after the United States. Um, and what they called themselves is the Islamic State in Iraq and Syria. They wanted to go back to this, what they see as the purest and most holy old school form of Islam. And remember again, not criticizing any religion. Um, and so they, what they do is they start taking over all of these places in Northern Iraq. Now, the Iraqi army at the time is not well funded. It's also corrupt. They've got a lot of problems. The training didn't go as well as the United States hoped it did. And the Iraqi army actually just runs away from these guys. And what they do is they leave tanks and weapons and things. They just ran away from them. And these guys, the ISIS, they just take over the tanks and weapons. And actually, those tanks and weapons originally belonged to the United States. Whoops. All right, so what their goal was, was to establish an Islamic empire across the Middle East. And for a while, in 2014, it looked like they might actually do it. They took over a huge area of land, and I'll show you. They took over a lot of Syria, and they took over a lot of Iraq, and notice, they made it all the way almost to Baghdad. Now, at the same time, they kind of did some really, really bad stuff. Uh, if you recall, in 2014, 2015, they started put, putting videos on the internet of where they would cut people's heads off, and they captured some Americans and like killed them. Uh, they burned some people alive and put it on the internet. Some really, really, really bad stuff. Do not look up that stuff. So they, um, they did all this bad stuff and they got a lot of attention from around the world and the world's like, yo, what are we gonna do about this? And obviously it fell on the United States to do something about it because the United States had just been most recently involved in Iraq. And so the United States starts bombing the crap out of them. And they did a really good job of this and ISIS really lost the battle very, very quickly. Also, there was a group of people called the Kurds, the Kurdish people here in Northern Iraq who they are, they are basically like an ancient tribe of people who have lived there and have wanted to have their own country for a long time. Um, uh, but they fought ISIS as well. And the United States supplied them with weapons and money and helped them fight. Um, so ISIS really is basically not in existence anymore as far as being an actual state or country or empire or whatever. They're not really a big threat anymore. And in fact, they've kind of, they've kind of just become a terrorist group again and a lot of them have said, okay, I'm not really ISIS anymore because ISIS isn't really a thing. I'm going back to Al-Qaeda because they're the original ones, okay? So ISIS has kind of basically fallen apart uh, thanks to U.S. airstrikes, um, but they've kind of turned back into Al-Qaeda. And like I told you before, Al-Qaeda's gotten really strong again and they've done a lot of attacks. So it hasn't necessarily gotten better, it's just changed. Um, it is better in that ISIS doesn't control as much territory. Notice they have a ton of territory. This is October 2017, and now ISIS territory is just down um, the purple dots. So they just have like some tiny little cities. Um, and these guys are quickly advancing. And this was as of January 10th, 2020.
they do, they still do kind of exist, but not really. Okay. Okay. All right. Who was Abu Musab al Zarqawi? And again, I would highly recommend if you're interested in this stuff, uh, do some research on your own. The the page that I found for ISIS on the internet was like so long. So it's a lot of history, it's a lot of names, and there's a lot of key players in this, but I'm just giving you the basics. Uh, who was Abu Musab al Zarqawi? He was leader of Al Qaeda in Iraq. So Al Qaeda in Iraq kind of later becomes ISIS after this guy dies. Because it's a lot of the old guys that were in Al Qaeda who went to jail who joined ISIS. Okay? 17, why did Bashar al Assad, remember he was the Syrian president, Syrian dictator, why did he release, the, release these guys who are former jihadists? Those are terrorists from Syrian prisons. Why did he release them? So the US would not support Syrian rebels. Because these guys immediately, they go, I mean, these guys are violent guys, these jihadists, they're terrorists. They're violent, they want to get out of jail so they can go fight. They fought forever, that's been their whole life. So as soon as they get out of jail, they're going to go join a rebel army. So the U.S. would not support rebel armies. And again, I know there's a ton of information. Just trying to give you the basics. Significance of Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, he was the first leader of ISIS. He is dead now, by the way. The United States killed him, I want to say in 2014, it might have been 2015, and I may be wrong about both of those, but I know, I know he's dead now. Uh, 19, what was, what was ISIS's main goal? They wanted to create, create an Islamic empire. So they wanted to take over several countries. For a while there, it kind of looked like they were actually going to do it. They took over that big part of Syria. They took over that big part of Iraq. They were stealing oil and selling it, and they were making millions and millions of dollars. And at one point, I think they had an income of like a hundred million a year, or maybe more. Um, a lot of money. They had a lot of money, and they had a lot of resources. Okay, but then they did too much violent stuff, and they got way too much attention for that. And the United States jumps in and bombs the crap out of them. And so by 2015, what had ISIS been re reduced to? Um, a terrorist group. Basically uh, Al-Qaeda. So I'll just put basically Al-Qaeda again. Because a lot of the members were like, okay, it seems like ISIS is defeated. I'll just go back and join the original group again, Al-Qaeda. And like I told you, Al-Qaeda is growing, so. It's still something to be worried about, for sure. Okay? All right, pause if you need it. Let's go ahead and do the next one, which I believe is the Taliban. All right, so the Taliban. The Taliban came apart, came about, not came apart, they came about after the Soviet-Afghan war, okay? So after that war, the country fell into a civil war because they didn't really have a government after the war, okay? So they basically became who's going to be the strongest group that wins this civil war and becomes the government. And guess who it is? It's the Taliban. Now, the Taliban, again, are these old school fundamentalists uh, who happen to be Islamic. Remember, again, I'm not criticizing Islam. They want a very old school type of society, Old Testament type society where women don't really have any rights at all. These are, these are Afghan women, okay? Um, they can't really show any skin. They're not allowed to go to school. They're basically not allowed to do anything except for stay home and take care of the kids, okay? So, in Afghanistan, for a long time, the Taliban have allowed terrorists to just kind of hang out there, including like Osama bin Laden. Um, it's kind of like a Wild West part of the world. Afghanistan has never been conquered by any of the world's great powers. Um, and the United States is still fighting a war there that they've been fighting since 2001 because these guys, you just can't, they can't be beaten. It's because of the way the country is. The country is very mountainous and they know the terrain really, really well. And not only that, but they are, they help out the people that are there, but they also keep them under the strict rule. So the people there are really, really poor. So they'll turn to anybody who will help them. <laughs> and sometimes, excuse me, sometimes the Taliban will help them. We'll talk about how they help farmers. Um, but unfortunately, they do rule with this kind of like old school, eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth type law. Okay. Now, 
after 2001, remember after the September 11 attacks, um, the United States came in and they fought back the Taliban. And they really pretty much crushed the Taliban pretty quickly and the Taliban withdrew to all these rural regions. Now, like I told you just a minute ago, uh, Afghanistan is a very, very poor country, okay? Very, very poor. And unfortunately, a lot of ways that the country makes money is through opium. Uh, opium is a drug that's in heroin, okay? So they, they have very large poppy fields there and the people there are poppy farmers. So they're literally engaged in illegal global drug trade, okay? And I think it's something like 90% of the world's heroin comes from Afghanistan. So the Taliban protects these local farmers because the Taliban make a lot of money off these local farmers in the heroin trade. So the Taliban protects these farmers and they keep the United States from coming in because the United States is gonna stop that heroin trade too. That's one of the goals. And uh, the United States is trying to stop that heroin trade and the Taliban stays in and they're like, no, no, no. So they fight for these rural farmers and they take care of these rural farmers when the government kind of tries to shut them down. And so that's why the Taliban actually still is kind of legitimate in Afghanistan because they're taking care of the people who have literally nothing else, okay? So it's a lot, a little bit like the Vietnam War is how I would describe it where you're fighting this group who you don't actually really know who they are because if you look, let me go back to a picture of them. They don't dress as soldiers necessarily. Um, they're easily disguised due to head coverings. Um, and in fact, there are cases of this. Sometimes these women who are, who, you know, they're supposed to be women, they're actually men who are just hiding um, and they're actually fighting for the Taliban. So they blend in really well with the local populace. They take care of the local people. They're also really bad to the local people when they do something wrong or they're not doing what they want. So it's just really, really bad. And the other problem is, is the United States, just like in Vietnam, often when they get attacked by the Taliban, the United States will respond with too much force. Innocent people get killed. And then the Taliban says, look what the United States did to you. Come fight for us. And of course the people are like, yes, of course I will come fight for you, okay? So it's really bad. Um, honestly, I don't really know a solution to this problem. Maybe just talking and just kind of figuring it out. Um, but I don't think the war has worked very well so far and it's still going on. And uh, the government is still kind of going back and forth with peace talks, but the Taliban are stubborn. And it's really just a very sad situation which has happened in Afghanistan. I feel really, really bad. I feel really sorry for all the Americans who have fought there because it just kind of seems like there's no end in sight. Um, it's just kind of a bad situation overall, okay? Um, so yeah, so that's the Taliban. It's pretty depressing actually to talk about, so yeah. All right, so let's do this. Number 21. How did the Taliban govern their territory in Afghanistan? It's a very old school type law. Old school law, harsh punishments. And women have no rights. Not good. Okay. How did the Taliban support terrorists in the years leading up to 2001? They let, train, they let terrorists train in Afghanistan. Okay. Who did the Taliban receive support from and why? They received support from local farmers. In exchange, of the poppy trade. There's no other, there's not a lot of other ways to make money in Afghanistan. This is their number one thing, but remember poppies make opium. Opium is the main ingredient. Heroin, heroin is illegal. So they're basically involved in this big global drug trade and the Taliban, they, they protect the farmers who are involved. So local farmers uh, in exchange for protection of poppy farms. Because remember, the Taliban gets a cut too. How is the war in Afghanistan similar to the Vietnam War? Well, you're fighting an, insurg an insurgency. <clears throat> so there's 
no clear enemy. You don't know exactly who the bad guys are. And remember, a lot of times the local villagers, even though they're bad, they support the Taliban because they offer something to them, they offer this. And when you have nothing, something is better than nothing. And <laughs> excuse me, what is the Taliban's current approach to the war? I didn't really talk about this because I got distracted about talking about how sad the situation is. The Taliban at this point is just kind of playing a waiting game. They realize in America that Afghan the war in Afghanistan has kind of become unpopular because it seems basically unwinnable. Um, the government's still trying to make peace talks, but the Taliban keeps doing violent stuff. So the United States is just delaying, withdrawing. It's just a real bad situation overall. Um, so they're just kind of waiting, waiting for the U.S. to leave. They're still doing violent stuff. They say, hey, this war has been going on almost 20 years. That's America's longest war. Okay. And they're just kind of playing the waiting game at this point. All right, let me check my answers, see how they look. Remember to pause if you need to. Email me if you need to. Let me get a sip of water. I've been talking almost an hour. We're almost done with this one. This is a big, long one. All right. Rock and roll. Moving on. Okay, this one we're going to go over really fast. The Black Hand. The reason why we're going over it really fast is because it doesn't really exist anymore. Um, but the Black Hand is the group, the terrorist group that led to the assassination of the Archduke Franz Ferdinand. And the reason why you need to know that is because that's what kicked off World War I. And World War I completely changed the game. World War I was the first modern war in global, global history, meaning machine guns and tanks and airplanes and things like that. Super violent. And it's basically the Black Hand's fault that it got started. One of the reasons why it got started. Uh, remember this guy, uh, Gabrilo Princip, I believe is his name killed this guy who was the leader of Serbia because they wanted to have a united, uh, they wanted to unite all these uh, Slavic countries, you know, those are the countries in Eastern Europe, um, and they believed the way to do it was to kill this guy. And when they killed that guy, everybody's friends jumped in on the fight, and before you know it, the whole world was at war. So really the only reason why you need to know the Black Hand, and like I said, it's real quick, is just because they kind of started World War One. So, assassinating, I told you that one would be quick. Franz Ferdinand. Which started World War I. Now, I know somebody out there is gonna say, well, there was really a lot more going on with World War I. Yes, I know, militarism, uh, all the alliances, nationalism, imperialism, and then this is what really started it though because that's what was the tipping point. It was kind of like the lighter hitting the fuse that blew up the bomb that started to hit the war. Okay, so the Black Hand, they're the group that assassinated Franz Ferdinand, which started World War I. Okay, that was real quick, real easy. If you're interested in them, do some more research. Um, that's really, I don't know much about them other than that. Um, there's not a whole lot out there about them. Um, but yeah, so that's what they did, started World War I, basically. All right, last group, I believe. And unfortunately, the group that's here in America, the Ku Klux Klan, the KKK. Now, basically their long-time goal has just been to suppress the rights of other race groups, mainly African Americans, okay? Remember, after the war, after the Civil War, um, the KKK was born, and their main goal was to intimidate African Americans. They were trying to keep the Old South alive. They really didn't want slavery to end, and so they figured the best way they could do it was to keep uh, the black population from voting and just to keep them from participating in society in general and moving up. So they figured if they could keep them down, keep them down, um, then that's the way that they could continue their way of living, which is white supremacy, which is really, really bad. Racism is terrible. All right, now, um, mainly operated in the South, however, they were nationwide and still are nationwide. Uh, the KKK still does exist. There's not as many people in it as there used to be. But um, things were bad, particularly in the South. If you remember the Jim Crow laws and all the racism. Um, there were a lot of lynchings in the South. Lynching is murder, usually by hanging. Um, remember the KKK did things like the Birmingham church bombing and they burned uh, the buses, the freedom rides, things like that. So the KKK has a lot of big history of violence in the South. Please don't Google that stuff because it's graphic and it's ugly and ugh, it's not good. 
Um, but the KKK is a racist group in the United States. Um, and they're a white supremacist group, they believe. The white Christian American way is the best way. And that's really not Christian at all, to be honest. So, um, nowadays, well, let me tell you about historically. In the 1920s, the KKK got huge, millions and millions of people. Um, but in the 1930s and 1940s, the nation had bigger struggles overall, the Depression and World War II. So racism kind of fell a little bit by the wayside because everybody was struggling all together. Um, after that, it went a little bit back up, but nowadays it's the KKK is kind of tr trending downward, um, not many members. Uh, most of the members live mainly in Mississippi, South Carolina, and Texas. Now, nowadays, they classify themselves not as a hate group, but rather a Christian organization, it's not Christian, um, who disagrees with the, the way America has changed politically. Um, but a lot of times what you see nowadays is that the KKK and neo-Nazis have gotten together um, and they basically are a racist hate group, okay? Um, KKK still does exist, um, unfortunately, so keep your eye out for that. Don't let it stand. Not good, okay? All right. What has been the long-term goal of the KKK? White supremacy. over other races, particularly African-Americans. Particularly African-Americans. Okay. Next one, how did the KKK influence the history of the Southern states? Uh, kept the Jim Crow laws in effect. Why did the KKK's numbers diminish in the 1930s and 40s? That's because of the Great Depression and World War II. So the whole nation as a whole was struggling. So they didn't really have time to focus on being racist. They were focusing on getting a job and surviving and then World War II. Uh, a lot of American men, I would say probably the majority of American men, uh, went to fight in World War II or at least joined the military. Um, so they don't really, the racism wasn't the focus of the time period. All right, how have KKK chapters rebranded in America, but how have they also remained unchanged? They say now, here's what they say. Not a hate group. And I'm gonna put a slash, but many of them have teamed up with neo-Nazis. Nazism by default is hatred, okay? Teamed up with neo-Nazis. All right, so there we have it. So that was a whole, whole, whole lot of information. And I know in a lot of them, especially like the PLO and the IRA, um, I just kind of touched on just very briefly what the struggle was with those groups and what their motivations were and all those sorts of things. Um, I highly encourage you to do your own research on a lot of these groups because you'll find out a lot of crazy stuff, some of the things that have happened. Um, like I said, I just kind of touched on the basics of a lot of them. Guys, please, I really, I don't think I said anything offensive and I wasn't trying to. That's not my intention. I was just trying to present facts. Um, if you have any problems with anything I said, please reach out to me and let me know because that's not my intention. My intention is just to teach you history, why these groups exist, some of the stuff that they've done and uh, kind of the significance why we need to know about them. Um, please email me with any questions. Please visit my website so you can check out these PowerPoints up close. Um, I think there's some pretty cool pictures in some of them. Um, but yeah, uh, like I said, let me know if you need any help with anything or if you got any questions, comments, or concerns. Guys, I hope you have a great day. I hope you learned a little something. And yeah, see you later.